New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, I'm pumped, ale pumped, to invite you into our time machine and visit one of my favorite spots in the past. A spot that still exists right here in the present. It's McSorley's Old Ale House in New York City. A vintage saloon which boasts, We were here before you were born. That slogan is written in ancient gold paint right on the window. And once you pass through those swinging saloon doors, you really feel like you're stepping into the past, into the long history of New York City, dating back to the mid-19th century. Old John McSorley opened the place in 1854, replicating a tavern back home in County Tyrone, Ireland. His son Bill picked up the mantle at the turn of the last century, eventually selling it to a retired NYPD officer and a couple of other families, keeping the place, same as it was in old John's day, at least as close as possible. If you dream of time travel as more than just a corny metaphor for interviews, get yourself to McSorley's. Like the old clock on the wall, they say its hands halted when Admiral Dewey won Manila during the 1898 Spanish-American War, Time seems to have stopped cold at the small bar on East 7th Street in Manhattan, right where 3rd Avenue melts into the Bowery. Even Prohibition couldn't shut the place down. A staggering array of memorabilia, photographs, dusty artifacts, and stories await your oohs and ahs at this East Village landmark. Though not all are as dusty as they used to be. For more on that cryptic remark and a few other times McSorley's has been changed only by force, we'll meet a man who literally grew up in the bar. His name is Rafe Bartholomew, and his book is titled Two and Two, McSorley's My Dad and Me. And I view it as an heir to Joseph Mitchell's classic 1940 piece in The New Yorker, McSorley's Wonderful Saloon. It brings to life some of those Ashcan School John Sloan paintings of the bar, and it really makes you feel like you're behind the bar, watching Rafe's father work, watching Rafe learn and grow as a man. Rafe is also the author of Pacific Rims, Beer Men Ballin' in Flip Flops, and the Philippines' unlikely love affair with basketball. He was one of the editors of Grantland, where he wrote and edited sports features. You may have seen his work on the ale-polished 24-foot mahogany bar at McSorley's, or in Slate, the New York Times, Deadspin, wherever fine writing is found. Follow him at Rafe Boogs on Twitter, that's R-A-F-E-B-O-O-G-S, or at RafeBartholomew.com. You can also check out his father, Jeffrey R. Bartholomew, known as Bart around McSorley's. He's been a fixture at the Taps for half a century, And he's the author of two books himself, The McSorley Poems and Light or Dark. Find those at themcsorleypoems.net. John and Bill over a century and a half ago. Bart and Rafe today. It seems the sun always rises at McSorley's, sometimes at 4.30 a.m. to get to work, spread the sawdust on the floor, and sling cheese plates washed down with only two types of ale, Light or Dark. No Guinness, no Bass, and forget those colorful cocktails you might have seen James Woods and Michael J. Fox tippling in 1991's The Hard Way when they shot a scene at the bar. Not much of a TV either, so forget watching a Super Bowl at McSorley's. And I laugh at the notion of Wi-Fi. If you have an elbow on that bar, please don't be staring at your smartphone. Check out, say, the tributes to the firefighters we lost on 9-11, or the shell fired to soften up the German positions on Normandy Beach for the D-Day landings. If you look around, you'll find a picture of people who came to the bar, like Douglas MacArthur. You'll see a picture of a lot of our presidents, 
who were coming there before they were in office. And you'll see people that nobody can identify anymore, but once they were as real as you or me. Okay, now that we've settled into one of the wooden tables where everyone from Abe Lincoln to Theodore Roosevelt and John Lennon, Woody Guthrie, Frank McCourt, Spiro Agnew, Elvis himself, sat for inspiration, let's join Rafe Bartholomew in order two and two. I'm sitting on historic hallowed ground here in New York City, McSorley's Old Ale House, formerly known or originally known, I should say, as the Old House at Home. It's the oldest bar in town and one that remains defiant in the face of time itself. Take that time. <laughs> Across from me is a living patch in the quilt that is McSorley's long life. He's Rafe Bartholomew and he's author of Two and Two, McSorley's My Dad and Me. Thanks for welcoming the History Author Show into your second home. Dean, thank you. It's exciting to be here. I mean, at my second home, but also talking to you. I think of the kid that you used to be, and I love that you start the book off with that. I love that you have this instant connection with people, especially now with readers through the book, but just through people who've passed through McSorley's or have heard of it. Every angle in this bar offers a different view, a different little slice of history. You look One way, you see an 1815 article on Waterloo. You look that way, you see a wanted poster for John Wilkes Booth, not to mention the chair that Abraham Lincoln sat in when he came to the bar after his Cooper Union speech up the street. Cooper himself, his picture is here. I want to give people a little bit of setting the scene here. The giant portrait of William McKinley, T.R., Chester A. Arthur, bust of JFK, Houdini's handcuffs, the pot-bellied stove is like the ones that used to warm the elevated stations. The 3rd Avenue L ran right at the end of the street here. So as a boy, that little boy we meet at the beginning of 2 and 2, describe this bar through your eyes as you got to know it. I got to know it, you know, obviously different from almost every customer who walks through the doors because my father has been a bartender here since 1972. He used to bring me in as a kid. He'd bring me in when I was about five years, starting when I was maybe five years old on Saturday mornings and show me around. And I mean, you know, Richie, who's working here today, would be working the floor on those days. And I don't know how much help I was back then, but he'd still let me try and help throw the sawdust on the floor and show me how to mix the mustard in the mornings. And back then it was still mixed and served in the in the ale mugs. Now oh, yeah. we, we have uh, actual dispensers with tops because it's a little slightly more sanitary, although the mustard here is so strong, I don't know if it needs it. Yeah. And then... I got to really absorb the history, listening to the stories, sort of wandering around, looking at the walls, and they'd see me staring at something, staring at the picture of old John McSorley and, and his son Bill outside the bar, and, and then they'd start telling me the story. You know, this is it was originally called the old house at home, and where does Be Good or Be Gone come from, and the history of women in the bar. I was extremely lucky to sort of really grow up in the place and learn it almost in an, a history of oral tradition, you know, oral history tradition of stories passed down from bartender to bartender, waiter to waiter, you know, um, and and then, of course, get to supplement that by reading the actual history of the bar and the various places it's been chronicled. One thing I wanted to mention, the Houdini handcuffs, the ones hanging above the bar, and the ones on the rail uh, belong to Daniel O'Connell, who was the third owner after Bill McSorley, John McSorley's son of the bar, the sort of the second family to take it over in 1936. Daniel had been a police officer, and he symbolically, when he was moving on from the force, retiring and buying the bar, he put his cuffs down there on the rail as a little piece of history, you know, to lend some permanence. And the Houdini handcuffs that hang up above the bar, the story is that Houdini, who's from, you know, lower Manhattan, lower east side, passed through McSorley's and there happened to be a policeman drinking in the bar, saw the famous escape artist and challenged him to break out of a pair of real cuffs, did it no problem. And to commemorate the moment, he donated the cuffs to the bar and they've been hanging there ever since. So many great stories yeah. like that. And I love that your book, Two and Two, McSorley's My Dad and Me, sitting here on the table at the bar, it's just a place where you can write all these things down and share many of these things because I imagine lots of people come to you and say, well, wait, you grew up at McSorley's? In fact, you had a great line about your agent where you wrote your first book, Pacific Rims, and then she said, well, what's your idea for the second one? And you said, well, I don't know. I grew up at McSorley's. At least that's how I read it. That's true. (laughs) That's how you sounded in my head. Oh, she's like, she kind of looked at me like I was crazy and was like, hold on. 
That's your. That should have been your first book. Like, what is wrong with you? Um, not quite. What is wrong? With you. She didn't say what is wrong with you, but that was sort of the tone. The sort of like, you lunatic. You went. You know. I mean, my first book was about the Philippines. You know, it's like you you lived in the Philippines for three years writing about basketball, which was not exactly an easy sell in the publishing oh. world. Whereas McSorley's is this beloved institution in New York, and I happen to have a unique experience as as a writer to grow up in it, and and then eventually do spend some time working here as well. Speaking of Houdini, there used to be when there were cats in the bar, they used to say when the cats are in the front, it means Houdini's ghost is here. People probably know that there, Houdini said he was going to be the one to come back from the afterlife. He was going to break the bonds of death <laughs> itself, which as far as we know, he hasn't done yet. But it makes me think of your book in many places and that Irish tradition and tradition also of Jewish people, people who've suffered a lot, have mm -hmm. that oral tradition in part because you're frankly getting your house burned down and driven around and you have to emigrate a lot and move. And so it becomes the telling of stories and also the humor is a way to deal with that. Greek people are very like that as well. Chapter four of two and two is titled the art of storytelling. And that strikes me right now. Speaking of Houdini, speaking of these stories that sort of mix things like the mythical jackalope that's there <laughs> over the icebox, right? It's fact and fiction mixed together or the coconuts over the bar that old timers sometimes try to pass off as shrunken heads. Yes. And if you've drank enough, you're probably willing to kind of squint at it and believe <laughs> it, right? So they're actually a gift from a 19th century painter to John McSorley. That's the earliest story of them. So where does the line between Blarney and fact lie? And how did you decide just where to draw it when writing two and two, McSorley's My Dad and Me? Well, yeah, it is, especially with the stories that are just passed down that aren't necessarily backed up by hard historical fact that's verifiable. For me, I did everything I can, especially, you know, I was trained as a journalist. I have a fact-checking background, you know, uh, so I, I don't take that stuff lightly. You know, wherever I could find a way to really verify stories and make and, and bring in the real truth, I would. And then the straight oral history of the bar, I think people understand or we understand in here that there is a little bit of elevation embellishment, blarney that goes into the telling and retelling and retelling of stories over the years. But the canonical stories of the bar, the wishbones, the World War I wishbones that soldiers hung up before shipping out to fight in the Great War, that stuff we, we, we don't mess around with. You know, you, you're not going to get someone uh, playing games with, with some of the, the stuff that inside the bar we really hold dear as parts of the history. But yeah, you know, sometimes someone will come in and be like, yeah, George Washington drank here. And, <laughs> you know, if we don't feel like setting them straight, we just let them, let them, let them run with it. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's how it goes. I had that with a friend of mine one day and we'd, we'd been here for a while for like the whole afternoon, pretty much. And different shifts of people coming in and out at one of the big tables there, which people may be familiar with the Woody Guthrie picture, him yeah. there with his guitar right, right in front. So similar to how it looks today, except that I guess the Papa, it still was painted uh, whitewash yeah. back then, but uh, and the guitar with the famous uh, "This Machine Kills Fascists" on it. And we were sitting there, and he said, "Well, this is this is a second location, right? It burned down." And since neither of his eyes were pointing exactly in the same direction, I just said, "Oh, yeah, okay." <laughs> I figured he would just let it drop, but then he asked one of the bartenders, "Said no," and he came over and said, "But you you said that's right, right?" I said, "No, I just didn't feel like I just didn't, I just didn't correct you. <laughs> I just didn't, this wasn't the time. I was going to get back to it later. That it's it's actually the uh, original spot." <laughs> For listeners not familiar with ordering at McSorley's, your title, Two and Two, refers to two light and two dark ales. Bugs are always served two at a time. It saved old Bill a trip, saved old John a trip back in the day. And they're not very big, so that's good for you, too. You order one, you get two. Can be confusing to people. And it leads to the question of questions. Which do you prefer? Do you have a preference, light or dark? Um, I think among the staff, you usually see a preference for light. We sell more light in general than dark. I think it may be like something like a 60-40 split. You sell a little bit more just because people are a little bit afraid of dark beer or they think it's heavy. I think they come in and they you, they think of dark. They think of a stout like Guinness, which ours is a porter. It's not really like that. It's quite sweet. It's nice. But anyway, to answer the question, um, I usually go for one and one. I, I split it up. I guess, you know, I, I probably drink just a little more of the light, but um, I, I, I try to stay pretty egalitarian about it and, and usually, you know, go right down the middle. I do like the dark. And I yeah. say when people ask me what it tastes like, I say, uh, I used to play violin when I was younger, and I say, well, if you had a really old violin case with the leather and then you strained a beer through it, 
which is not unlike what they do with right. casks now, right? They mature beer in an oak cask that mm-hmm. was used for whiskey or something. I said, that's what it tastes like. And that's, it tastes like history. That's a beautiful way to describe <laughs> it. And I, I think it's accurate, too. Actually, you know, you, you think about the dark, the drinkers of the dark. There, There's one customer who comes in and sits in the back and orders 12 darks at a time to himself. And will go through four, five, sometimes six rounds of it and never really looks totally like I don't know how he does it, but uh, he, he does it and he, he never looks totally out of control. Uh, he sleeps well, I'm sure, on those nights. <laughs> Andre the Giant type of imbibing. Yeah. And it reminds me of the fact that where we're sitting next to one of the newest parts of the bar, which by new and McSorley's is what, 80, 90 years? Right, about 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at that picture of the McSorley's cats or something, the bar is open at this end. This yeah. is a new part of it. But this was the table John Lennon would come and sit at by this window. Wouldn't drink the ale, I believe they say, when he was working. He would just right. drink a little Coke or what have you. Because, again, only only ale served here. You're not going to get the other things you might want. Lighter uh, dark, Coke, Diet Coke, ginger ale, seltzer tap water and i don't think that's changing anytime soon i mentioned taft we mentioned tr mckinley chester arthur who by the way if you ever look at a map of where he used to live for him to get here which why would you i'm the only person crazy enough but pretty much a straight shot here down lexington from where (laughs) where arthur lived and he loved to go to a bar and and hang out this this was the center of politics back then he was very much a political animal but i wanted to borrow a favorite phrase from our current president a fake news story (laughs) hit some years ago see i weave that in Claiming to debunk McSorley's origin, call into question that Lincoln speech here or this Lincoln visit after the speech at Cooper Union where he makes himself a real contender for the Republican nomination and changes history. In 2002, however, the New York City Landmark Commission confirmed the opening in 1854. The important thing about that to me that I got from two and two, McSorley's my dad and me, is your father's reaction to that assault. And I think from the way you write it, it surprises you too. And it brings you to this realization that this bar is not merely old. There's plenty of old things around, but it's actually historic. So talk about why did the truth of that date and nailing it down matter so much to your father, Bart? Well, I think because besides this place being a bar where my father and the men and women who work here, you know, make a living, they take a lot of pride in its place in New York history and in maintaining a tradition that has existed long enough to see the Civil War, the draft riots, the First World War, you know, both world wars, Vietnam, and everything that has come and gone in New York over 163 years now. And when some of the articles started coming out questioning the stories, the founding stories that the bar's history is based on, even though they weren't hard to debunk for Bill Wander, sort of our official McSorley's historian, and we knew that the stories and the history that we had learned and passed down was real, just the threat of it being put out into the world in the letters section in the New York Times or in the Metro story, some people would read it and whether or not it was correct would believe it. And that was a threat to the legacy that my father helps uphold and so does everyone who works here that what makes this special is that the place is real and it's been operating here in the same place in the same way since 1854 and when you start stripping away the foundation of that then it sort of can lead to crisis of self of identity how what is what does it really mean to work here if the place that you take such pride in isn't what you've learned it is, what you've been told it is, what you tell people it is. Simply knowing that you're right isn't necessarily enough. It's having the people believe you're right and being accepted for that history and protecting it. So it was about a lot more than just being right or wrong to my dad. It was about protecting his legacy and the legacy of the place where he sort of built his life. You mentioned the wishbones over the bar. One of the things people noticed right away and up until a few years ago and people would reach up sometimes try to touch them these dusty wishbones and usually the bartenders had the you know lightning fast like a bionic man <laughs> reflexes on that these wishbones with this really super thick dust and it drew people into asking about it now the bar here mcsorley's was a favorite of tammany hall But you can't fight City Hall, and that brings us to that 2011 travesty involving that sacred dust on the wishbones hanging on that gas lamp over the bar. 
what did those bones mean to you? Who were those doughboys who left them? And how did the owner handle the health department's order to ultimately clean them off? Yeah, one of my first memories coming into the bar as a child was staring up at those wishbones, which were covered in dust, and so much dust that they were almost hard to recognize as wishbones. You know, you would look at them and say, I, like, what are those things? Dad would come over and be like, well, those are wishbones that were hung up by a group of local soldiers who were shipping out to the First World War. It was right after Thanksgiving. They had a going-away party here at McSorley's, and they each brought in the wishbone from their Thanksgiving turkeys and hung it on the gas lamp for good luck. And then, of course, the guys who survived the war came back and each took down one wishbone. And that means the ones that remained belong to the guys who never made it back and have hung there as sort of a memorial to their sacrifice ever since. Until 2011, were untouched to the point that they were allowed to collect a solid inch and a half layer of dust that made look sort of like these like ghostly gray feathers. I think that was my version of the founding date that we just discussed, sort of what it meant to my father. I mean, I grew up thinking that was probably the most sacred thing in the bar, the thing that no one could touch, the thing that we would guard with, it's an exaggeration, but felt like we would guard with our lives. You would jump across the bar to stop someone from taking a wishbone or from doing anything. And it was the story that you loved telling most behind the bar. You loved sharing sharing that with people and watching the recognition sort of dawn on them what they're looking at and how sort of precious and fragile they are and life is, but also that you can leave them there and they will stay for what will now be 100 years. It's 2017, you know, 1917. And um, when the city health department asked us to dust them and, and we eventually complied with the order. It did feel like a travesty at first, but I think I got over that because they're still there and it became just the next layer of the story because when the whole staff was sort of up in arms, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop this? And it seemed like the last thing we'd ever consider doing was actually just dusting them. Matthew Marr, the owner of the bar, came in about three in the morning after actually my father and I had worked that night and closed up the bar came in on his own, sat on the bar in the middle of the night and dusted each bone one by one, put them back in their the same places where they hung and swept all the dust into a Ziploc bag and took it home with him to Queens. And it was a hard pill to swallow because I really did think that they never would be dusted. But the idea that Mr. Marr, the Matt, was willing to take that upon himself and not say, you know, hey, Rafe, you're the young kid or, you know, Shane, who was another young guy at the time, who is now near 10 years, you know, Shane, Rafe, you know, you guys, you know, just take care of this, wipe the dust off. But that he treated it as the grave sort of duty of the man who is in charge of of, you know, overall in charge of preserving the bar's history. Yeah, it became another part of the story. It became the next chapter in that became part of the oral history and the tradition of the bar and ended up giving me sort of confidence and restoring my faith that the bar's history was safe because, yeah, their little things may change, but the soul of the place isn't going away. And by the way, you're named after your great-great-grandfather, Raphael Egan, a great war veteran himself who was wounded breaking through the Hindenburg line. And I wanted to ask if he made it home to claim his wishbone, so to speak. Uh, he did, yeah. He was a judge in upstate New York after the war, and I am his namesake. I never met him, and I don't know if he ever drank in McSorley's, but <laughs> he did make it back. And my grandmother gave me uh, his, his Purple Heart, so we, we have it at home. And there's a picture of the many, many famous people in here. We could literally spend the whole show just listing them. But there was a picture one day that popped up somewhere that I saw it of Ian McClellan and Patrick Stewart at yeah. the time doing the X-Men characters. And I looked closely on it and I saw that one was having light, one was having dark. Ian McClellan playing Magneto, the evil having the dark, and Patrick Stewart having the light. I just wanted to hug them. It was just right. such a clever thing and so great to see them. I, I, I don't know if they planned the symbolism in that, but it, <laughs> it, if not, it was a great moment of serendipity, yeah, both for their characters and the bar and everything else. Yeah, it's perfect to be able to look and see those things and know that people are here and they're able to be regular. Yeah. Oh, there's the famous phone. It's probably not the Enema Man. No. That's one of the stories you didn't put in the book. Yeah, I was under some deadline pressure writing this book. <laughs> And I don't know how, how that somehow escaped me in the process. Um, but yeah, there is a caller who's probably been ringing this payphone behind us for 
about 20 years, usually on a Sunday or Monday afternoon, Sunday more often than any other day. And he calls and you answer, no matter who answers, if it's one of the waiters or customer sitting right here in front of the phone picks up, first thing he says, your enema is ready. <laughs> And he just kind of runs with it from there. He is a more gifted improvisational, you know, prank caller than I can sort of keep up with. I've tried a few times and he kind of, you know, he sort of talks the circles around me. But some of the other some of the other waiters can can get into a really good back and forth with him. We don't know who he is. We don't know if he comes in and is a customer. We don't know if he's never been inside the bar. We don't know where he's from. He's called and mentioned the Philadelphia Eagles a few times during football season. And so we don't know if he's doing that because he's tweaking the giant fans in the place or if he's actually from Philly and an Eagles fan. And there have been times when he's described us in ways that make it seem like he could actually see us. Now, maybe he's just, you know, kind of good at playing games like that, but he's built up like a little legend of his own. And also become sort of, you know, part of the fabric of the bar, you know, when he doesn't call, we start talking amongst each other and saying, hey, what's going on? You think the enema man is all right? Is he going to call soon? Anybody heard from him? And uh, lo and behold, he usually calls back. I remember you said uh, you were all excited the first time you thought you might get a shot to pick it up, and then it did. You kind of froze. And yeah, well, sure you know, I've say. been I've been hearing my dad come home and talk about, oh, you heard you this guy, you won't believe it. This guy called in and said your enema is ready, and he's been doing it now for a month. And then this started happening when I was too young to really work a shift here, still in like high school. And then when I did graduate into. Uh, picking up some extra shifts as a waiter, a bartender, and, and, and I thought I was going to get it on a Sunday afternoon. Had all my lines prepared and just choked. <laughs> Things are so automatic for you. And watching you walk around in here, for instance, I said to you when you had to go behind the bar, you could have done it blindfolded. I could have could literally blindfold you and walk you anywhere in here, I bet. Pretty close. I mean, I've never tried it. I'm sure it would be harder than it seems. I'd do better than, uh, than than the average person for sure. And honestly, the comfort level and the expertise, the muscle memory that I've seen in my dad and Teresa when she works the bar, the people who've really been here for you know decades and have that kind of experience blows me away. The kind of just you know learned skills that you know, they pick up, the way that you you can hear when the stem of a mug breaks when you grab them and you can it just makes a little clink and you know you look at it and it's cracked or because McSorley's only accepts cash the way that waiters and the bartenders can sort of if they need 20 singles they can almost pick it up without counting it the handful of, of dollar bills they pick up always ends up being right around like somewhere between 19 20 21 it's that experience is doing repetition and your body just really becomes a part of the place it comes you know it's like an extension of your body i can testify to that fact too it is amazing when you'll see this park really crowded say on a saturday afternoon everybody talking all kinds of sounds the street seventh is right outside this window and somebody will put, slam that glass down too hard or hit it into another glass because the table's usually yeah. covered and a bartender will just come flying through yeah. you know the crowd again which which is a feat in itself because it's packed shoulder to shoulder and yet they'll come through and they'll assess the situation half like the first step right and see if this person needs to go or if it's just a glass that broke because it was too stressed over time my my hand's pretty big i can't i can only fit like two fingers or three fingers in, in a glass so but it's something though all those little things and through two and two you get to see all of that you get to see not only the way that a bar works, but the way that this place becomes historic and keeps that identity as much more than just somewhere that's a stage. I was saying to you that waiting outside on the old beer barrels, that it'd be a shame if the entrance to the brownstone upstairs became just the stage door and people are out there waiting for autographs of people who are playing characters, because they're not. This is a, a working, functioning bar. It's not trying to be anything but what it is. That title, Two and Two, refers, in my mind, when I picked it up, when I first saw it, not only to John McSorley and his son, maybe, but you and your father here in the 21st century, draw some parallels between this apprenticeship as you grow from being that young boy who's coming in here and your dad is keeping an eye on you. My dad, like when he was a mechanic, for instance, he, he didn't want us to be too enamored with the cars. Right. I want you to go to school and you're going to do something else besides, you know, be never able to get your hands clean to go to a wedding and get the dirt under your fingernails. They That's part of the immigrant experience. They want you to do better. Although my dad was born here in New York City, it's the same thinking. And your dad was born in Ohio. They they wanted you to 
love what they were doing and respected. I believe talking to them now as grown yeah. men, but they wanted you also to set your sights higher on that. So talk about some of those parallels that you see between your apprenticeship under your father and those between the elder and younger McSorley's. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's, a, that's really a, a poetic way of thinking of the title and one I, I wish I had, uh, done intentionally. Um, <laughs> but it, it is great. You know, I mean, it, it has, and, it speaks to the family nature of the bar and that it has always been, you know, passed down between families. I mean, between generations of the families that have owned it and starting with, with, you know, John and Bill McSorley and really the identity that we've carried through all over all the years started, I think, with their relationship with John's values and the ethic that he brought in, the sort of the be good or be gone, the idea that you don't need anything more than ale and a chunk of onion to have a good time and that anything stronger than that was trouble. And then Bill's love for his own dad and the way he ran things and the the fact that he was so committed to preserving those ways and then passing that on when he finally sold the bar to new owners. And, and it came from there. And that certainly is how my father and also everyone else who, who worked here and sort of helped raise me here imparted to me as a kid. And then as I started doing more and more real work around the bar, it's intentional, but it also just you fall into it because it's so ingrained in the way people do their jobs here. You sort of follow what the other guys are doing and do it the right way. And it kind of... Uh, I don't know. I think it forms a more powerful connection with the bar because you really grow up within it and within its ways rather than getting like a a handbook and saying, you know, hold the mugs this way. You learn by doing and by experiencing it. And, you know, my father certainly brought me here because he wanted me to appreciate the place and love the place in the way that he did. And at the same time, always hoped that I wouldn't necessarily follow directly in his footsteps or at least would have options to do other things if I dreamed of them. And luckily I've I've sort of gotten what has felt like a perfect mix of both. You know, I, I have gotten to work here and spend a lot of time on the floor behind the bar, working different sides of the bar and um and while also pursuing, you know, careers in publishing and writing books and doing those other things. So it, it has been a, a very fortunate for me to get to do both. And if anything, I think I miss the bar. You know, I wish I could have a little more of the bar in my life. <laughs> well, you're in L.A. now, is that right? Yeah, I've been in L.A. for a handful of years. I'd moved out there for a job with ESPN, editing a website they had called Grantland. Now I don't need to be there. Though. That website folded at the end of 2015, and I'm sort of on my way to finding my way back to New York, I think. I think uh, in the next handful of months. That's good. We'll look forward to having you back. Me too. We don't want to lose anybody in LA. <laughs> you talk about that, about Grant Land, and about this idea of this, what they call a blue collar work ethic. And people can use that kind of as a condescending term or, or as a pejorative term. But my friend who I mentioned, his dad told him when he brought him here, he was an iron worker. He brought him here when he was about 16. And he had this phrase that he said to me one day about bringing a blue collar work ethic to white collar job, a job in radio, a job writing, as you said, at ESPN. How did that affect you? And as you, you know, now you're in your thirties, you look at yeah. young people today who really don't take these summer jobs. It's kind of gone away. You had that job and you learned basic things, showing up on time, hiding your displeasure is another important thing. If you tell somebody you're a bartender at McSorley's in particular or at any bar, they know you have certain skills. So how did you apply? that when you found yourself then going into a world where you wouldn't come home soaked in ale but maybe a little soaked in ink what was the application there yeah i think working at a at a bar working in service working in a lot of blue collar industries it grounds you you know whether you end up doing other stuff or just stay in it for me you find a lot of pride in what you're doing and doing it well you know it's it's something that you know maybe customers don't always recognize or you know the same way that people take for granted the buildings they walk through that somebody had to build and everything else that people make that it takes real people to make and then people use and sort of forget the how how it all got there but you take pride in those little things and how when it gets busy in here when it gets sort of really really hectic you know we know how to handle it you know we know how to read people and handle ourselves in a crowd and and i think that sort of stuff helps whatever you end up doing after that or if you end up doing the same thing or if you know if it helps walking down the street just because it, you carry yourself in a certain way not not 
overconfidence, but just you've interacted with all kinds of different people in a bar, whether they're famous. McSorley's has a lot of foreign customers, whether they're from all over the world, wealthy or not. You sort of feel like you don't have to worry about getting along with people in different situations and also standing up for yourself. And it just gives you, a, I think, a strong grounding. It makes you who you are and you don't lose that. Yeah, if you don't have those kind of experiences, maybe you do lose your head a little, or you know, not everybody, but you can sort of get caught up in other stuff and maybe, um, I'm not sure exactly how to say it, but for me at least, the bar is an anchor, you know, and it's like, I know who I am because I came from here. It doesn't really matter where I go. I mean, I've lived in the Philippines, I've lived in Los Angeles, I've worked at magazines and websites, but I, because of that, I'm still, I, I still am, you know, I still, still know where I came from, where I've, and kind of where I belong. My dad worked in sales after being a mechanic in New York City. Mm -hmm. These are the 70s and 80s. So this is a tough time. And you had those moments in your book where it's great to have a dad you're so close with. I mean, you're, you guys are incredibly close. So you yeah. say people comment on it. And he said one thing to you, for instance, that it's such a small thing, but I thought of it when you said about walking down the street and about not being intimidated. Somebody said, oh, I expected to be insulted and treated yeah. crappy when I came to McSorley's. Why are you nice? You went right to your dad and said, what do you think? You know, am I being too soft? And your dad had such a great response. You can afford to be a little nice, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, my father is about 6'3". I'm 6'3". We are solidly built. And so, yeah, we're we're big enough. Uh, and, and my dad is also, I think, probably a little bit, I don't know if it's a word, but like sizest, heightest, you know, he, uh, he has an extra appreciation, maybe a little unnecessarily extra for when people have a certain level of height. So yeah. And, and there is this thing at McSorley's where, you know, we are known for having a certain gruff level of service, like when it gets busy and we make people share tables. Sometimes we make people leave tables if the bar is busy and they're done and can't hang out all night. It just doesn't work that way. So there, there's this sort of gruff level of service here that the bar is almost become beloved for, you know, because you know, you know, there are people who come here to get sort of bossed around by someone and say, you know, drink up or go home, you know, something <laughs> like that. So when people complain to me about being a little bit too courteous, or not complained, but just were like, what, you know, what's the deal? Like, I thought you guys were, you know, we're all tough in here. And I've heard my father say, yeah, I don't think he's got enough of an edge to work in the bar, you know, about people over the years. I think everyone finds their own manner that works. And customers all kind of respond to it differently. I think what matters is authentic. You know, you're being yourself. You start off nice. That's great. You know, and people like that. And they see you working hard and, and they respond to that. And for the guys who are a who come off a little more gruff, that's part of the character of the bar too. And everyone sort of finds their own, it's almost like finding your own voice in, in service, you know, and in, in dealing with, with the people you interact with at the bar. And once you do find it, they fall right in line with it. They see what you're giving them and they sort of give it back to you. It's just like natural reciprocity and everyone sort of finds their own way. It's pretty cool. Authentic's the key word there. Yeah. It's you just being you and it's not an act here at all. You go in a place and you can tell right away if it's an act that they're going to give you crappy service. It's like, no, I, that, that's not what yeah. I came here for. Save it for you know somebody who, like you said, there are actually people who want to be treated like I went to a real New York bar and it's just an Applebee's or some <laughs> chain outhouse where they just figured that'd be a good way to treat people. And also in two and two, you then are able to appreciate the way somebody like Teresa will deal with them or some of the other bartenders here. I mean, they're all shapes and sizes, I guess you'd say. And you're able to appreciate looking from inside their eyes. It's a great thing you do throughout the book is you let us see exactly what each of them is doing and how they find that balance. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things I think I'd been exposed to it throughout my life, just being around the place and, and growing up around a lot of the folks who work here. But then to actually start working with them and really seeing how they manage the job, manage working with people and how they relate with people and seeing everybody's sort of personality come out in the way they do the job. It was really a great thing to witness, you know, so it was very, very cool for me. Another thing about Authentic I wanted to mention is your accent. This is what a New Yorker sounds like. So for people who go and watch a lot of these movies and things, like and they expect you maybe to sound extremely stereotypical. Like, this is a 
authentic place and this is real this is what new york sounds like and i get that too being from new jersey people yeah. want me to sound like i'm one of the sopranos and breathe through my nose and all this kind of things and why well, don't i have any gold jewelry around my neck if you could go to a place that maintains its identity when all around you little like rudyard kipling right keep your head when all about you is changing everything's going nuts that's just a, an amazing thing for people to come and be able to sample it and respect these things like these bartenders are paying for their beer that they get. That table is, is money to them. So if you're not gonna, if you're gonna be here and you you're just gonna sit, I mean, there's Panera Bread for that. <laughs> so this is a place where it's great if you want to come, but re- respect those things. It's great if you want to look at everything on the walls. Yeah. But I think of Bill and John, and they're both there, and they're they're wanting me to. You know, keep the place. People got to earn, right? Sure. I mean, that is definitely part of the job here, although it's very nice of you. And we appreciate that sort of level of concern and wanting to care for the bar in the same, you know, in that way. Although, you know, as customers, people are here to serve you. And, and I think everyone here learns pretty quickly, if they didn't already know it, that if they need to ask a group to move to a different table, if they need to ask a group to leave for one reason or another, it's not something that people are terribly shy about here. So you usually... Find out pretty quick if you're crossing a line in here, if you're doing something that is getting on somebody's nerves. You learn right away not to be shy about explaining that to people in whatever way works is the most authentic to you as a waiter or a bartender or whatever. I think that's sort of what's great about McSorley's is that you can come in and at different times of the day and the week and see different sides of the bar it almost feels like it transforms at different times of day. You know, like we're here in the morning and the light's pouring through the windows in the front and it's pretty quiet. You, know, you can order nothing if you, you know, sit around and have a Coke and no one's really going to mind. You know, you're not costing anybody anything. Wander around, take in the walls, you know, be really, really sort of experience the place that way. And sometimes it can be like that late on a Sunday night or late on a Monday night. And then when it gets really busy, you know, and then after work, Fridays and Saturdays between say seven and ten at night, then sure, then it's then and then you see a whole different thing. You see the whole place sort of humming in action, people all over the place breaking out into song, the staff sort of really starting to hustle and find that next gear of effort. And so there's a lot of different ways to appreciate the bar and it has a sort of different faces and people kinda come in and choose the side of the bar that they like to experience most. So it's really cool. I want to get back to some of the history of the place. In 1970, a federal court ruling forced McSorley's to open these swinging saloon doors to women for the first time. One thing I learned from Two and Two, McSorley's, my dad and me, was that there was a moral rather than a sexist reason behind Old John's ban, which is something that I should have known, knowing that the Bowery here was lined with black eye places they'd fix your black eye because men were fighting all the time but i didn't think of it so take us back to those days when what a mixed clientele would have meant in old john or old bill's day right so when mcsorley's was open in the second half of the 19th century there was not really such a thing as honest social drinking in a co-ed atmosphere any place where men and women were served together was basically either an openly running brothel or some sort of slightly surreptitiously running brothel uh, where it was, you know, people cruising for dates that they would pay for. And so in old John's day, having a bar where he only served men was really a, a way of signifying that this was a place that was running sort of above board. The only business here was serving good ale, raw onions, and no ladies, as his original (laughs) motto goes. And the Bowery in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in those days was, you could call it, the original Skid Row of America. It was down and out. It was gangs of New York. It was uh, near the old Lower East Side slums and McSorley's location right sort of at near the northern tip of the Bowery at Cooper Square means that it was right near that element. And I don't think in other bars that ran the same way would have also only served men. And that's what the standard pub that wasn't dealing in any sort of criminal or vice element on the side, I mean, other than liquor and ale, would have been serving only men. And what I think happened over the years is that Bill McSorley took over for his dad and pledged to run the place the same way. You know, there's a great line in the the famous Joseph Mitchell article about McSorley's where it says, like, it pained Bill to make a repair in the bar. He just didn't want to change anything. And, And that 
ethic got passed down when the bar changed hands again in 1936. Bill sold it to Daniel O'Connell. And, you know, it was done with sort of a gentleman's promise. I don't believe it was contractual, but it was one man's word to another, one owner to the other, that you're going to run this bar the same way that Bill's dad, John McSorley, ran it. And that was how they did it. And then, of course, it became, you know, you walk around the bar here, you start to see newspaper clippings from the early 1900s when McSorley's is already starting to be known as a place that's lasted a long time. It's 50 years old already. And it starts to become known as an old-fashioned place, a place that doesn't change. And it starts to become part of the bar's popularity, a selling point of the bar. So I think the effort to keep everything the same at the bar may have outlasted its welcome with regards to not serving women until 1970, when finally, through the efforts of civil rights lawyers and women's rights activists, the uh, federal district court ordered the bar to open its doors to women. And before then, John Smith, the bartender in those days, you know, the, the head manager, women sometimes, when it became an issue when the women's rights movement was really picking up steam and they wanted to open McSorley's up before 1970, sometimes women would come in in disguise. Sometimes they would march right in and try an order and he'd ring the chow bell behind the bar. Everyone would go quiet and everything would stop. Nothing would be served until the women would agree to leave. It was not done with bad intent. It was sort of a, a relic of a different era that outlasted its welcome a little bit longer than it should have, but it gives the bar a special history that you don't really see anywhere else in the city. And another feature of McSorley's is what Frank McCourt described as the massive urinals in his book, Teacher Man. That was a great moment for me that he walks across the Brooklyn Bridge and he's just had a breakup and he talks about coming here and having 20 and 20 and 20 and 20 more. <laughs> I usually refer to them as the Taft urinals because they were put in back when the 27th president was in office. Almost big enough to fit <laughs> the 27th president and all of his girth inside as well. And that said, women are admitted in 1970. When did they get a bathroom? A week? A month? How long do they have to hold it? Uh, just 16 years. No, There's <laughs> nothing unmanageable. The women's restroom was put in in 1986 when uh, there's just a renovation in the back room. The bar put in a full kitchen that's now on sort of the right side of the back room in the corner. Prior to that, the kitchen was a smaller area where it was really meant for assembling cold sandwiches, cheese plates, and they weren't cooking hot food. They weren't making the burgers and the, the dinners back there. And during the daytime, they would hire a service to bring in hot food for lunch. And the nighttime until 1986 was still mostly just sandwiches, cheese plates, and that sort of stuff. And then, you know, while they put in the kitchen, they figured you might as well also put in the women's room where the old kitchen used to be. You sit in the back, you watch for women who will accidentally wander towards that room. It's in the back left, ladies, so you can not have to have that embarrassing moment of walking in. Yeah, back left. It's not so well marked. The door has a sign that says ladies, but it's a bit high on the door. And it's right behind a table that when the bar is busy, you might actually not know that you know there's anywhere to go back there. And of course, the men's room, because there was no need for two toilets for so much of the bar's history is only marked toilet so women will walk back and say oh it's a toilet you know we're sitting in mcsorley's old ale house unlike e cummings it is not snowing outside and snug and evil inside but it is a wonderful summer day as rafe said sun streaming in through the window rafe bartholomew is my guest he's author of two and two mcsorley's my dad and me you can find him at Rafe Boogs on Twitter, that's R-A-F-E-B-O-O-G-S, or at RafeBartholomew.com. Publishers Weekly writes of two and two, quote, Bartholomew chronicles history and demonstrates how a crude, unforgiving, and extremely macho camaraderie sustained his family through suffering and loss, unquote. Rafe, I don't want to give too much of the book away. We talked about having this conversation supplement some of that historical stuff that you weren't able to fit between the covers of Two and Two. But we can say that you weave your mother's illness as well as your father's tales of abuse at the hands of his alcoholic father throughout Two and Two. I wonder how your dad felt about sharing so much of the personal life with readers when I can picture some people coming here after they read your book and just sitting at the table when it's slow like now and just staring at the guy. People are going to really feel like they've read your dad's mail. They know everything about him. How did he feel about that? Yeah, you know, I think it goes back to you mentioned before we do have a sort of, I guess, unusually, not, I don't know if it's unusually close, but a very, a very close relationship. And we've been that way for a very long time, you know, partly because my father's work schedule here at the bar 
allowed him to really spend a ton of time with me as a kid. You know, he wasn't working a nine to five, you know, he's working nights. So he was able to take me to school, take me to the recreation center and rebound for me when I was shooting around playing basketball and bring me to the bar on weekends. So it really started from there, that closeness and remained that way over time. We've lived together as adults for several years on and off whenever I've lived in the city and it feels absolutely natural you know it doesn't it doesn't feel strange at all to us and so when I was working on the book and you sort of couldn't avoid these personal stories and how they intertwined with our lives at the bar I actually was sending him chapters as I finished them chapter by chapter so he was reading each chapter as I got through it and telling me what he thought what was good and bad and what what you know if I had made a mistake if I got a story wrong it's funny for whatever reason neither of us thought that some of the really personal stuff was as shocking or surprising or noteworthy as it is or as people may see it thinking like wow wow it must be weird to have that published about you my father is a himself a you know recovered alcoholic you know he got sober on the job and is sort of used to talking about the problems he's had in his life and how he overcame them. And I guess to me, writing about some of that, knowing that he really did, you know, his, his story, despite, you know, yeah, he, his, his own father was a, was a bad drunk and was abusive to, you know, their, his entire family growing up and, and sort of passed the gene on to my dad. And he had a rough 10 years in his early adult life struggling with alcohol. But knowing that he emerged from all that and became sort of the guy who raised me and this sort of person who I always looked up to, it wasn't hard for me to write about it. I didn't feel like I was revealing something negative about him because it was so clear that he had kind of he defeated it all. You know, he really found himself behind the eight ball in a lot of ways, things that were out of his control and things that mistakes that he made and then turned it all around and managed to figure out ways to achieve his dreams and find a, a family and a life both at the bar and at home with myself and my mom. Behind that row of taps where your dad has made a career, each one of them capped, by the way, with a replica of old mutton chop enthusiast John McSorley's head, which is one of the million. <laughs> you wonder why people can't find the bathrooms because just sensory overload, right? Little things like that that you could come here 30 times and not notice. Your father's a fixture there for 50 years. In two and two, you describe a ghostly figure that looks very like him here in this eight-man photograph of the McSorley's nine baseball team that's actually right behind us. It reminded me of Jack Nicholson in The Shining, where he shows up in an old picture, and who else? The bartender tells him, you've always been here at the Overlook Hotel, Mr. Torrance. So I thought that was pretty great when I read it in two and two. But casting the supernatural aside, talk about briefly, how your dad got that start here. How does he come from Ohio to being in New York City and then end up working at this iconic bar? Sure. And I mean, this was almost too good to be true and not something that he had shared with me before I started working on the book. I've actually found out from reading his handwritten journals that he kept, I guess, you know, my generation will have emails, but it was amazing to just have the opportunity to go through these notebooks that he had kept over the years. But anyway, I'm reading it. I get to the point where he moves from 1967. He's, you know, basically one summer out of college and decides to move to New York. His first night in the city, he's staying at a international youth hostel, uh, which was a few blocks east of where we are right now on 7th Street and ends up getting drunk at McSorley's on his first night in New York City, which blew my mind. Whether it's the ghost in the in the photos that looks a little bit like him, or whether it's little details like that that he actually drank here on his first night in New York, make it seem like there's a hint of destiny in him ending up here. But he didn't actually end up working at the bar for another five years. He lived in the East Village, had apartments on 13th Street and Avenue B, Bleecker Street and the Bowery, you know, different spots, and then ended up living upstairs from the bar and sort of took over an apartment that a friend of his who ha was holding and who was uh, drafted and going to serve in the Vietnam War. So my father took over the apartment, began living above the bar in 1970, and that's when he really fell into, the, like, you know, McSorley's life. He started working. In those days, McSorley's wasn't open on Sundays, so he was working with a crew of guys, mostly, you know, a some of them who also lived upstairs, some of them were just neighborhood guys who would come into the bar and do repairs on Sundays, you know, like put the tables back together, clean up, oil the bar. They're like the general maintenance crew. And then 
not long after that, you know, if you're living upstairs and you're an able-bodied man, it's sort of, there's a, a good chance eventually someone is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey man, you want, you, you, you free on uh, Thursday? You know, you got a shift open. His came through a, a act of slight deception that he was sort of unaware of. He was still drinking at the time. And uh, the waiter, who is sort of legendary around here, named Doc Zori, who also lived upstairs in one of the apartments next to his, my father was drunk. Zori was getting off his shift here and actually heading out for his night. My father was drunk coming home from his, and he saw Zori and he's like, hey, Friday, I'm going to have a great party at my place. Tons of chicks, blah, 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 blah. Zori's like, oh, yeah, I'm coming. Uh, he's going to take off work. So my father didn't know what he was talking about. He was blasted. He woke up the next morning, had no recollection of any of it, and then comes downstairs to just sort of check in, pick up his mail, and at the time, uh, Harry Kirwan, who you know, whose mother owned the barn, he was managing it for her. He he says, "Hey, you know, Zori, the the waiter who he told about the party, is taking off on Friday. Can you cover for him?" My father didn't forgotten the entire conversation with him, and he's like, "Sure, I got, I'll work." And that was his first shift that he uh, inadvertently stole from uh, from his neighbor. McSorley's first opened those doors in 1854 when, speaking of presidents, Franklin Pierce was in the White House. When Franklin Pierce left office, he famously said, there's nothing left to do now but get drunk, which he did very seriously. And unfortunately, that ended up contributing to his death, really a broken man from the moment he enters the White House. That alcoholism and overdrinking is something that certainly touched your family and the bar. John McSorley, as you said, felt men didn't need anything more than an ale. You deal with that very frankly in the book, which I thought this is good to read as so much more. I really didn't know what I would get when I opened it. It's not just the history, but it made me think of Pierce. It made me think of this idea of walking that line and your dad, this incredibly inspiring story. I mean, if people do come here and stare at him in awe, there's that's certainly somebody to stare at in awe that you could be here and you could serve beer every day and be an alcoholic and not fall off the wagon and not feel anything conflicting and just do it, deal with it well. How did you decide to hit that just right? And what was your thinking about working here and people who think, oh, I, I hear it too, so you must. Oh, it's just a place where young people go to get drunk and it, it's terrible. And what did that mean to you to deal with that head on? Well, I think, um, you know, and this is something that, that you, you know, my, my father has sort of said, had told me over the years and I've seen myself and it sounds, you know, for those of us who are lucky enough not to have had serious alcohol problems, it's very hard to imagine, like, how could you possibly get sober while every day going, you know, spending seven hours, eight hours in a bar and just around booze all the time. Soaked in it, literally right. soaked. And guys, and, and, you know, there were times when... Some of the guys, you know, the regulars or some of the other guys working here might, you know, mess around with him and try and spike his ginger ale or, you know, there's stuff like that happened. But the thing that he always told me was that people, especially career bartenders, tend to either, they either had a problem and stopped. There's a, you know, small chunk who just never really have a problem. They're able to, to drink socially and it's not a problem in their lives. And then they're the guys who sort of drink themselves out of their job and sometimes, you know, into an early grave. So it's less uncommon in the profession than it seems from the outside because it's so, uh, it's, it, it does, it is hard to imagine how you could do such a, you know, defeat addiction while surrounding yourself with the temptation of the very thing that you're addicted to. In writing about that, and the fact that, yes, McSorley's is a great old place that, that means a lot to a lot of people, but also pe alcohol you know, is a destructive factor in a lot of people's lives. Growing up with my dad kind of put me in a unique position to understand that, where you honor the social place, the very special social atmosphere that can exist in a bar like McSorley's and, and in other bars, but McSorley's perhaps in a different way because it has this age, this history, the ability to bring people together, sort of jam people together at tables to appreciate the, the magic and the history of the bar while also having a respectful fear for alcohol, you know, and like I, I, I do drink, but um, I came to it much later in life than probably other people I grew up with because I was afraid to ever touch it. And I'd heard stories, you know, my, my parents' stories about what it, what it had done to them and, and thought that I had the gene. I'd heard them talk about the gene. So I thought that, you know, one taste and, I, and I'd be going down the same path. And they actually had to have a talk with me when I was uh, in high school. 
Maybe it's the Anima Man. No, we'll see. <laughs> Make some more of these. Hello. Uh, lost their chance. <laughs> Yeah, they actually had to have a talk with me uh, when I was in high school when they realized I was kind of slinking away from my friends who were going out drinking or, you know, going to parties and stuff. And they kind of were like, hey, it's okay if you want to, like, have a drink or something, you know, just be careful, don't be an idiot, and know that you have this history that could be a problem. So be extra careful. You don't have to never touch it. You don't have to become a weirdo. Um, you don't have to become antisocial. But just keep an eye on it. And if you ever have a problem, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the moment, I think, that he talks about as an ex-drinker, that you just realize you can stop. It's not easy to do alone, and I don't think they recommend doing it alone, but you can get off the elevator is kind of the line. You know, You don't, you don't have to ride it all the way down. You write in 2 and 2 that cats were another longtime fixture at McSorley's, as depicted in John Sloan's painting, McSorley's Cats. They said old Bill reserved his kindness for animals, those cats, horses, and the goat that he kept out back. Tell us about the cat called Red or Sawdust. I think maybe it picked her here over your head, or maybe that's one of the minis, I guess, there. That's one of our minis, yeah. yeah. (laughs) There was always a cat named Minnie here. But tell us the fate of the final mini. Sure. Um, well, Sawdust was really the first cat I uh, I fell in love with here. It was our, you know, the cat that uh, I think uh, they brought into the bar around 1985 when he was a kitten. And um, one of the things that I was tasked with as a child when they bring me in on Saturdays is, uh, you know, um, feeding the cat, playing with it a little bit, entertaining, entertaining him, then bringing him downstairs uh, once, once, once business hours started and it was time to sort of, get, you know, get the cat uh, to, to safer con- confines on what was going to be a busy Saturday. Um, but um, it was just, you know, it was sawdust. We called him sawdust because he was, it was kind of like a, a orangish tabby, basically the same color as the sawdust on the floors. Some of the other old timers called him red. Didn't really matter. And um, just a playful, you know, really outgoing, crazy cat. My, you know, he would he would jump up on the bar and drink water from a mug next to the next to the customers if the bartenders put it up next, put it up there. So it was really just a fearless cat that that really helped me fall in love with the place. Um, and you know, was even memorialized in poem by one of the the uh, the uh, the figures who lived upstairs and was a sort of a handyman around the bar, Gene Hall, um, wrote a poem after, after, you know, the cat died, uh, in 1995. So, uh, and yeah, cats have, I mean, obviously, you know, John Sloan painted them, you know, for and the drawing, the painting is ba- was, was based on is from 1913. The painting was dated to, you know, the, what, 1928. And so the cats have always been a fixture of the bar here. I guess our last mini was, had to go home in 2010, 2011. She was another great one. She was super sweet, very fun, playful. And it just so happened that there was a morning sort of like this, not too busy. Customers were messing around with her, and I guess she scratched someone, and it led to a lawsuit, which was not a big deal. I think it was either thrown out or a cheap settlement. You know, it was not a a huge thing for the bar and its owners. But because it was an attention-grabbing issue, it it ended up in uh, in the Daily News, there's a big full page where they kind of made a joke. You know, they ran a, a photo of the kitten, you know, smiling, kind of like get, beaming into the camera. And it says, does this look like the face of a killer? And then it sort of went to describe the lawsuit and kind of make fun of the lawsuit as being, you know, a little bit frivolous. But that drew attention from the city and you're not allowed to have pets in an eating and dining establishment. Eventually, you know, Pepe, our bartender, one of the, one of our longtime bartenders, took that mini home with him and uh, we, it was our, the last of the mixer early cats. Hopefully times change and uh, and we decide to let cats in because uh, let cats in again because they were a part of the bar for so long and um, as far as I know they, they didn't contaminate anything, they didn't hurt anyone. They were they probably helped. Some cats have lawyers maybe. I think Felix the cat has a pretty good lawyer actually so maybe you know women fought for their right to come in and you know, join Mother Fresh Roast who's one of the, the one woman who was allowed in here and uh, old Bill would give her a, an ale and she would sell some peanuts and said her said her husband died in the Spanish American War of a lizard bite. That Amazing. Was, that was her story. And there's a little flag in here that she embroidered an American flag from back then. But Amazing. Maybe we'll get cats back in. 
<laughs> uh, well, you know, if, the, if it ever goes to uh, the Supreme Court, I'll, I'll write an amicus brief. <laughs> well, I'll testify. I have a lot of pictures here. I came once for my birthday in Minnie because I'm a cat person. They've always been drawn to me from when I was little, and that was my veterinary background originally in my original career. And I have a bunch of pictures with her. And my wife said, I knew if I was going to take you somewhere for your birthday, it'd be great. There'd be Minnie would be there. Maybe a cat would come to your birthday. And she was just a, a total mush. I'm glad she got a good home because uh, Pepe is a great guy. He also has many, many great stories. Oh, he, yeah. He has a book in him alone. So, well, I've just about everyone here does. It's, yeah. it's, it's great. <laughs> Today, there's a lot of tourists. We'll see them wander in. Not a, not a ton at this early hour, which is a great hour to visit McSorley's if you want to look at the historical items. But people will come in, snap pictures, look around in awe. I kind of think about you at seven walking in here and, and looking around in awe. It's kind of great to see. You'll see older people, white hair, and do you think that they've seen everything? And they'll walk in here and just stop right on that yeah. spot three feet in from the door and just look around and be blown away. This is not a bar in a box, which you can buy now to make your own little Irish bar. And while it's no longer the place where it's just working class regulars, where they sit snug and evil as E. Cummings did here, or when you had O. Henry, you have so many great authors, all kinds of great people coming here. It's in travel guides, it's stop on bus tours, and the neighborhood has come a long way from being Skid Row. In two and two, you describe the fear that this could lead to Big Sorley's bartenders becoming nothing more than historical reenactors at a renaissance fair or like the Guinness Brewery they say well this may be the only Irish bar people see so we set it up just so but there's not a soul there it's kind of a Potemkin facade it's a set right when you go watch Good Times or something or Sanford and Son you know that's that's just a set there's no soul there right so what do you think will have to be maintained here so that in 80 years people will still be reading to him too and they'll read joe mitchell and they'll say this is the same place meaning when they walk through those swinging saloon doors what do you hope they'll find what will they need to find and which of those core values passed down to you from your father and instilled in you will have to survive for mcsorley's to still be the bar it is today and has been for 163 years of yesterday Man, technology moves so fast these days that looking ahead something like 80 years is sort of, it's hard to imagine what the rest of the the city and what the rest of the country and the world will look like then. But I am pretty confident that Mick Sorley's is not going to change. The lifeblood of this place is the tradition and the history and operating the same way that it's run since we opened it. I mean, we still have John McSorley's Rosewood cash box behind the bar with three slots for singles, fives, and $10 bills, and they put the 20s on the side. That's the identity of the place. That's sort of what everyone here is committed to preserving while they make a living. And I don't see how that's going to change, even if the rest, you know, no matter how the rest of the city changes around it, because that is not just me who's raised in this bar. You know, I mean, Teresa, the bartender today, is Matt Mars' daughter, you know, and she and her family works here. The extended family works here. I mean, there are lots of people who are raised in the bar in, in various ways and are committed to keeping it the way it is. So I, I think that. As long as, you know, they're serving light and dark and it's the same walls, the same sawdust, the same kind of way of running the bar, the identity isn't going anywhere no matter what happens to the rest of New York. I think the sort of core of McSorley's almost only gets stronger and more special the more the rest of the city transforms around it. Well, Rafe Bartholomew, great note to end on. We've been sitting in McSorley's here, and I'm dying for a liverwurst sandwich and some of that spicy mustard, not to mention a couple of dark ales. I really enjoyed this book. I hope that came across to everybody. Two and two, McSorley's My Dad and Me. I wish you the best of luck with it. I hope people will check you out at Rafe Boogs on Twitter, in part because you retweet a lot of the <laughs> pictures that I tweet out, things like the wishbones back when they still had dust and a lot of the historical photos. This is really a place that is historic, not just old. If you want to get a view of old New York, if you want to make some memories yourself and say, I can come here with my dad today or my son today and then come back and 50 years and know it'll still be here we can remember right where we sat and we can taste the same ale and this is the place to come and this is the book to read it really does stand up there with joe mitchell's book so it's really great thanks for joining me thank you so much dean it's been great
Again, the book is Two and Two, McSorley's My Dad and Me. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take it Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. Think of it as tipping your bartenders. I really can't thank Rafe Bartholomew enough for taking the time to talk with me about his book in his second home. And I have to thank everyone at McSorley's wonderful Timeless Saloon for giving us that John Lennon table to sit and talk and really travel back into the past. I hope you all felt like you were right there with us. You know, as a writer, song lyrics rattle around in my head a lot of times. When I was reading Two and Two, the song was The Highwayman. By the ensemble group of musical legends, Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, and Chris Christopherson. In the final stanza of the song, after his incarnation of the Highwayman dies, Johnny Cash says he'll be back again, perhaps as a Highwayman, or he may simply be a single drop of rain. Maybe that's how Johnny would come back, but I'd prefer to think of him as a single drop of McSorley's ale. The dark, of course fitting for the man in black. I thought of that song because Rafe Bartholomew's book, Two and Two, really submerges readers in a drop of ale, glistening on the bar, listening to people talk. He invites us to watch the cast of characters passing in and out of New York City's time capsule on East 7th Street. I didn't think I could enjoy McSorley's any more than I do, but Two and Two added to the experience I get sitting there inviting friends in and showing them around the various pictures. McSorley's is so much more than just another stop on the Lonely Planet Guide. And now that you're back on Wi-Fi, you can visit our guest at RafeBartholomew.com or follow him at RafeBoogs on Twitter. That's R-A-F-E-B-O-O-G-S. For more on his dad's two books, visit the McSorleyPoems.net. And remember, you can always let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at HistoryDean or facebook.com slash history author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time-traveling with us to a place that only Superstorm Sandy has managed to really close down in 163 years of history. As Bart says, people can buy a mug of ale for cheap all over the city. They come to McSorley's because it still feels real. Have a great week, everybody, and slancha. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.